Welcome back to Logic. This is a series of videos on natural deduction proofs. In part seven, we're going to go through some sample problems of proofs with all of the inference rules, both the implication and the replacement rules. Our first sample of problems, and these are taken from the logic textbook by Stan Baronet, published by Oxford University Press. Um, these are proofs that are designed to be completed in only two steps. One step will use one of the implication rules and one step will use one of the replacement rules. So they're a good way to ease into practicing using all the rules. So you'll notice our conclusion is S wedge P and the general strategy is to look for the conclusion if we can find it in the premises. You'll notice we have S and P as consequence of conditionals in our first premise. So this should remind you of a rule there is one rule that has as one of its premises a conjunction of conditionals, which we have here on line one. And the conclusion using this rule is going to be a disjunction. And the disjuncts match the consequence of those conditionals. So perhaps you can remember that rule. It is constructive dilemma or a CD. However, you'll notice the other line of our premises, T horse you are, does not match the constructive dilemma rule. So before we can use constructive dilemma with line one to derive our conclusion, we have to use another rule on line two. And line two is meant to be in the form of a wedge or a disjunction or a statement if we're going to use constructive dilemma with it. So what rule can we use on line two to turn it into a wedge? That rule is implication which allows us to go from a horseshoe to a wedge with the negated first disjunct. And now you'll notice those two disjuncts, tilde T and R, match the antecedents of our conditionals perfectly. So we can use constructive dilemma then to complete the proof. So we use constructive dilemma on lines one and three, and we are done with this one. Another sample problem, our conclusion is meant to be Q wedge S. You'll notice that our premises also have the simple proposition T. So we want to use some rules to help us eliminate those. Q wedge S do occur together on line one. However, they're separated by parentheses. So is there any rule we could use to shift where those parentheses on line one to group Q wedge S together? That rule is association. It only applies to cases where you have um, a case where it's a disjunction one of the disjuncts of which is another disjunction or a conjunction, one of the conjuncts of which is another conjunction. So you have to mind the main and the subordinate operators in these cases. This one fits the rule so we can use association on it to group Q wedge S together. And now there's one more rule we can use to derive our conclusion. That is disjunctive syllogism, which allows us to go from a disjunction and the negation of one of the disjuncts to proving the other disjunct must be true. So now let's look at some problems that can have any number of steps using any of the implication and replacement rules. So in this proof, we're supposed to prove R wedge S. You'll notice R does occur in one of our premises in the third one, but not the S. So we're going to have to introduce S using a logical rule. First, let's just focus on proving R. We're trying to get R all by itself before we can use another rule to add S to it. So what rules can we use with our premises to work closer to having R on its own? Well, first you'll notice that we can use modus tollens on lines one and two. So that allows us to prove not not Q. Modus tollens lets us move from a conditional or horseshoe um, and also another premise that's the negation of the consequent of that horseshoe, in this case tilde P, to derive the negation of the antecedent. So you'll notice the antecedent tilde Q from line two already had one tilde on it. We have to add another tilde to it when we're doing modus tollens. So now you should be able to think of a rule using lines three and four that will help get rid of the Q and just derive the other disjunct. And that rule is disjunctive syllogism. You'll notice here we have the second disjunct tilde P horseshoe R. We're not quite yet at having just R by itself, but we're getting a lot closer. The final step to having R by itself is using modus ponens. In this case, we're using a line one again. Now, many proofs do not require you to reuse premises, but some do, and this is an example of that. So we're reusing premise one. You can use any premise as, uh, as much as you want in a proof. There's no uh, limit to the number of times you can do that. Now that we have R by itself, we have to use 
one final rule to introduce wedge S, and that is addition. So addition is the rule that lets you introduce uh, a wedge after any proposition you have on a complete line of a proof and any other proposition you want after the wedge. So now we are done. And a common mistake with the addition rule is using it to just um, add whatever you want uh, with any operator. But no, it only works with the um, disjunction, the wedge, and you can only add to a, a complete proposition that you have um, on a line of a proof. You cannot apply it only to parts of a proposition. So now let's look at a, another proof using all the implication and replacement rules in any number of steps. Our conclusion is meant to be B wedge R. And you'll notice we do have R and B on lines two and three, but they're embedded in a lot of other stuff. So on the one hand, we have R and B as consequence of conditionals. And that should get you thinking about a rule. That rule is constructive dilemma. The conclusion is supposed to be the disjunction B wedge R. And we have B and R as consequence of conditionals. And so that does suggest constructive dilemma. However, lines two and three do not fit the form of constructive dilemma. In fact, they have an irrelevant um, conjunct T wedge A, C, uh, sorry, T horseshoe A, C horseshoe D. Those do not appear anywhere in, in our conclusion. So to begin with, we can get rid of those conjuncts we don't need and just focus on the ones that we could potentially use with a constructive dilemma. So our first step is doing simplification on line two. We're just getting rid of T horseshoe A, focusing on the other conjunct because that's the one that's gonna be important to deriving our conclusion. Similarly, we wanna use simplification on line three to get rid of C horseshoe D and only focus on the other conjunct P horseshoe B. So now we're working closer to be able to use constructive dilemma, but we're not quite ready. First of all, constructive dilemma has as one of its premises a conjunction of conditionals. Therefore, we have to use the conjunction rule on lines four and five to get P horseshoe B and Q horseshoe R. Uh, and then there's one final step. You'll notice we have not used premise one yet. When we constructed the conjunction on line six, we wanted to make sure the order of those conditionals match the order of the disjuncts in premise one. Premise one is P wedge Q. This does fit the form of constructive dilemma because for constructive dilemma, one of the premises should be a disjunction the disjuncts of which match the antecedents of our conditionals. So in this case, because P is the first disjunct, it should match the first antecedent in our conjunction of conditionals, P horseshoe B. So now we are ready to use constructive dilemma on lines one and six to derive the conclusion of our proof. Another sample problem, we're trying to prove tilde P, and you'll notice we have P as an antecedent in the first premise. So as a general case, we could use modus tollens, at least potentially, to derive the negation of an antecedent. So we wanna strategize, how can we set up our premises to use modus tollens with line one to ultimately derive not P? Well, the way we could use modus tollens is if our other premise or another line of our proof were the negation of that consequent. The consequent of the conditional in line one is uh, tilde q dot r. So if we can negate that entire consequent, it would be tilde parentheses, tilde q dot r, close parentheses. Then we could use modus tollens. But you'll notice our other premise, r horseshoe q, it does contain those two simple propositions, r and q. That's the good news. The bad news is it doesn't look anything like the negation of that consequence. So we're going to have to do several rules operating on line two before we can get it set up to use modus tollens. First, we want to flip the order of the Q and the R because you'll notice in the consequent of our conditional in line one, the Q comes first, then the R. We can use the transposition rule to reverse the order of Q and R. Q started out as the consequent on line two, now it's the antecedent on line three. R started out as the antecedent, now it's the consequent on line three. However, when we do so, the transposition rule says we have to either add a tilde to both the antecedent and the consequent or subtract the tilde from both. On line two, there's no tildes, so we're gonna have to add a tilde to each side. So we're getting closer, but we still have the wrong operator. The operator in the consequent of our conditional line one is a dot. 
the operator on line three, the main operator, is a horseshoe. So we want to try to strategize how can we turn that horseshoe into a dot. We cannot do it right away, but we can start by turning the horseshoe into a wedge. The implication rule allows us to turn a horseshoe into a wedge. However, in so doing, we have to add another tilde to the first disjunct. So the general case of implication is you start from P horseshoe Q and you move to um, tilde P wedge Q. Um, and in this case, though, we already had a tilde on the antecedent of our conditional tilde Q. We're going to have to add another tilde so it becomes tilde tilde Q. So now we're only one step away from changing our disjunction on line four to a negated conjunction. And what rule can we use to do that? That rule is De Morgan's. De Morgan's lets you go from a disjunction of negations to a negated conjunction. You'll notice though, in this case, the first disjunct in our um, disjunction is a double negation, tilde, tilde, Q. That means when we use De Morgan's on line four, there's still gonna be one tilde on that first conjunct. You'll notice also it matches perfectly the consequent on line one. However, it has a tilde in front of it, but that's exactly what we want to set ourselves up for the last line of our proof. We use modus tollens with lines one and five, deriving the main conclusion of our argument. Okay, let's do another sample problem, this time with only one premise. Our conclusion, you'll notice, is a conditional that has a conjunction in its antecedent. And our premise is a conditional that has a disjunction in its consequent. In order to complete this proof, we're going to have to move Q from the consequent of our conditional in the premise to the antecedent of our conditional in the conclusion. So you should be thinking of a rule here that could let you move a proposition from the consequent of a conditional to the antecedent. That rule is exportation. However, we are not ready to use exportation directly on our premise, line one, because it does not fit the form of the rule. Exportation requires us to have a conditional or horseshoe in the consequent of the conditional. We have a wedge there, a disjunction instead. So we have to figure out how we can turn that wedge into a horseshoe. Um, there is a rule that lets us do that, and that is implication. However, we are not yet ready to use implication on line one, and can you see why? We first have to use double negation on line one, because the implication rule, the form of it, requires us to have at least one tilde on the first disjunct of our disjunction. So we have to use double negation to add two tildes to that cue before we can use implication to turn it into a horseshoe. When we use implication on the consequent of the conditional from line two, we're gonna lose one of those tildes because um, when we use the implication rule, the form of it is to always lose a tilde from the first disjunct when you transform it into the antecedent of the conditional. In this case, our disjunct tilde tilde Q had two tildes, so when we remove one, we're gonna have one left. Now that we've used implication on line two, we're setting ourselves up for using exportation on line three. And when we do that, it matches the conclusion exactly. Exportation allows us to export metaphorically the uh, consequent, uh, sorry, the antecedent of a conditional that's in the consequent of another conditional, take that antecedent from the second conditional, move it back to the antecedent of the main operator conditional, but creating a conjunction of those two um, antecedents thereby. So now let's look at another sample problem. We're trying to prove P horseshoe S. And you'll notice S does not appear in those premises. So whenever you see a simple proposition in the conclusion that's not in the premises, you should be thinking of the addition rule. Addition allows you to introduce new simple propositions after a wedge. So we wanna focus first on just um, getting P by itself on its own line before using addition to add S, and then we'll worry about how to convert the main operator into a horseshoe. So our first objective is to look at the premises, try to figure out how we could get P by itself. P is the antecedent of a conditional on line one. What rule allows you to 
get rid of the consequent of a conditional and to derive the negation of the antecedent. That rule is modus tollens. However, in order to use modus tollens on line one, we would have to have the negation of the consequent, q dot r. We don't have that. Instead, we have another compound proposition on line two that does have q and r in it, but it doesn't have the proper form of the negation of q dot r. So we want to look at line two and strategize to how to turn it into a negated conjunction of q and r. The first step is to convert the horseshoe into a wedge using the implication rule. This creates a disjunction of negations, tilde q, wedge, tilde r. And hopefully this will give you a clue for what rule we can use to get it closer to the consequent of our conditional on line one. That rule is De Morgan's. De Morgan's lets you go from a wedge of negations, a disjunction of negations, to a negated conjunction. And in this case, it perfectly negates the consequent on line one. So then we can use modus tollens on lines one and four to get tilde p. However, we're still not at our conclusion. We first have to introduce another simple proposition, s. We can do that just by using the addition rule on line five. And there's one final step because you'll notice the operator in our conclusion is a horseshoe and there's no negation on the antecedent. So we can use the implication rule to move from tilde p wedge s to p horseshoe s. Another sample problem. We are trying to prove a disjunction that has another disjunction as its antecedent. Parentheses p wedge tilde t close parentheses wedge q. You'll notice q does not appear in our premises, but that's a huge clue. It means we're going to have to add it using the addition rule. So whenever you see a situation like that, you can, for the beginning, ignore the, um, the wedge Q, ignore the wedge and the other simple proposition or other proposition you're going to have to add later. If you can prove the first disjunct, P wedge tilde T, then it's a simple matter, only one step to use the addition rule to add the wedge Q. So to begin with, let's just focus on P wedge tilde T and strategize. How can we get that out of those premises. You'll notice, first of all, we do have the T and the P in the premises, which is good, but there's also the R and the S. So R and S is not a part of our first disjunct in the conclusion, P wedge tilde T. We want to figure out how we can get rid of the R and S. The first step is to noticing that the um, first premise has R dot S as the consequent of the conditional, and we had something close to that in the second premise, but the R and S are apart. So we want to join them together using the exportation rule. And if you do this, you set yourself up for another rule you can use on lines one and three to get rid of the R and S. And do you know what rule that is? It's hypothetical syllogism. So you'll notice one and three are both conditionals and the consequent of line one matches the antecedent of line three. That fits the form of hypothetical syllogism. So we're, now we have T and P by themselves. However, T horseshoe P is not the same as P wedge tilde T. So we're gonna have to do a couple of further steps to get it to match the first disjunct in our conclusion. The first step is to use implication to change that operator from the horseshoe to the wedge. In so doing, we're gonna add a tilde to our first, to our antecedent, and that becomes our first disjunct tilde T. Um, so we're getting a lot closer to the conclusion. However, we have to do one more rule because we have to flip the order of the, the tilde T and the P in our wedge. The commutation rule allows us to flip the order of the disjuncts or of the conjuncts of a disjunction or conjunction. So now you'll notice it matches exactly the first disjunct in our conclusion. The last step is to just use addition to add wedge Q to our uh, pro compound proposition on line six. Remembering that addition allows you to add any simple or compound proposition you want after the wedge. The caveat is that you have to apply wedge after uh, an entire line of your previous proof. You couldn't use it just on part of a line. 